Today's scripture comes from the Old Testament reading of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Pray with me. O divine shepherd, you do guide us and lead us and comfort us and provide for us and lead us into life of abundance here on earth and eternal. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and glorifying to your holy name. Amen. So I thought long and hard on what to title this sermon from Psalm 23. After thinking about it for a while, I decided to title it Psalm 23. It seemed that it did not need to be titled anything else. Just Psalm 23 will do. It is one of the most recognizable psalms. It is read at most funeral and memorial services. I have prepared services with family members who are not particularly religious and do not recall where it is in the Bible, but will request a reading from that shepherding thing. That's what they will call it. Or someone said, you know, the one about sheep. They can't recall exactly where it is, but somehow they have a recollection of something about the Lord being the shepherd and the sheep that follow the Lord. Many of us growing up in the church have memorized it. I remember that because my mom made sure that I memorized it right after the Lord's prayer. But I am amazed at this popularity of Psalm 23 among Christians. But I am even more amazed at the Psalm 23 being so recognizable about from those who claim to be non-religious and even non-believers. I am amazed because this imagery of a shepherd and sheep is so far removed from our everyday life. Seriously, how many of us can truly say you personally know a shepherd? How many of us spend time with sheep? I must admit that the most I have seen of sheep close up is whenever I have a chance to go to a county fair. As little as we know of shepherds and sheep in our modern world, Psalm 23 has managed to permeate much of our world. Another reason that I am so intrigued with the impact of this psalm is because it doesn't jive with the culture in which we live. We, especially in the Western world, put so much emphasis on individualism, self-made success, pull yourself from your own bootstraps, that a poem about dependence and reliability on a shepherd 
does not seem to make sense. We who live in a world where self-volition is highly regarded, why don't we find this psalm of being led around by someone else offensive? We who like to take credit for all the successes and abilities to provide for ourselves are open to acknowledging that we have a shepherd who leads us to still waters and anoints us with our heads with oil and all the while prepares a table for us. Scott Hosey in his commentary shares that the reason Psalm 23 endures in this society that values self-reliance and independence is this. Because in the deep places of our souls, I suspect that we all sense that maybe everybody needs a shepherd. We down deep in places we don't talk about when we are laughing it up at a party, we long for someone bigger, wiser, and stronger to take care of us. Psalm 23 evokes this from us and in us. Everybody needs a shepherd because no one gets off the planet alive. For me, personally, I believe that deep, deep down inside, there's a recognition that we, as creative beings, are drawn to the Creator. It is as St. Augustine wrote in his confession, you have made us for yourself. O oh Lord, and our hearts, our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Let me read that again. You have made us for yourself, O oh Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. Could Psalm 23 nudge a restless hearts to be drawn to the very creator who gives us rest, rest today and rest in eternity. The beginning of Psalm 23 presents a picturesque scene of green pastures, still waters and righteous paths, which sounds all very nice. But who are we kidding? We know that life is not all rolling hills, pristine streams, and paved hiking trails. Similarly, the description at the end of the psalm is equally questionable. Yes, it is nice to have our cups overflowing and a table prepared for us in the presence of our enemies, but it isn't always like that. Is it? For there are times when our cups are bone dry without a drop in it. There are times when even the banquet hall, even though it is full, the table with everything that we will desire, we are so stricken with fear and anxiety that we have no appetite left. Yet, it is in the middle of the psalm that we find the realism of a complicated life. That is the reason Psalm 23 is always read in its entirety. Have you noticed? For it is when the whole psalm is taken together that we see the spectrum of our life's perspective. 
It is in the ebb and flow of life from green pastures and still waters to the travail of challenges in the dark valleys and shadows of death to the promise of provision and security here on earth and the hope of eternal life that make Psalm 23 so relevant to us. And through the ups and downs of life and death, it is the constant presence of the shepherd that make us lack for nothing. You see, in the Hebrew, verse, 20, verse 1 is an open-ended statement. The verb to lack does not have any does not have any object. As we read from the scripture, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It's not a complete sentence. It's a verb without an object. Doesn't it make you want to ask, want what? What is it that I shall not want? If the psalmist is writing that there is no lack, then our response would be, lack of what? It is left open-ended for you to fill in the blank. And whatever it is that you lack, as long as our God is our shepherd, we will not lack. In Hebrew poetry, Lines don't rhyme like English poetry. Lines do not rhyme, but they use parallelism. The first line is followed by a similar second line with a deeper meaning than the first as a supportive statement. It's like Tom Long once said, my son is 13 years old, but then he said he's a teenager. That sense, that teenager description says so much more than the chronological age, does it not? With all its innuendos that comes with it. Psalm 23 does the same thing throughout all six verses. The Lord is my shepherd. So I will not lack whatever it is I think I lack, for my God's grace is sufficient for me. Another parallelism, he makes me lie down in green pastures because God gives me provision so that I may lie content. But not only that, the shepherd leads me to water, and not just any water, but still water. You see? Sheep cannot drink from torrential water. They will not get close to it. They're afraid of it. They will only drink from still water. But the stillness of water means more than the current. It means a place of peace and calmness of the soul. It is being in the presence of God that allows our souls to be restored and renewed so that we may be led into the path of holy living and carrying out the work of God so that we may glorify his name. I hope you see the supportive parallelisms which continue on each of the next section. <laughs> Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. And the parallelism that strengthens this lack of fear is because the shepherd is with us. His rod and staff are used to protect the sheep and fend off predators. And they are the instruments that comfort us. Notice that evil is still there. The shadow of death is still there. The troubles are still there. The dark valleys are still there. 
But the shepherd is with us. There is no need to fear evil. You know, I've always wondered and been curious about the verb walk. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I don't know about you. When I am in a place where I am anxious and fearful, I don't just walk as if I'm taking a stroll in the park. Dark alleyways, my steps are hurried. I'll probably be tempted to sprint and run through it as fast as I can. I will want to go through the difficult times in my life as quickly as I can. I will want, to, I will want the distress and the pain to go away as soon as they appear. But that's not how life works. That is not how cancer works. That is not how medical treatments work. That is not how we determine how long war will take place. There's no way of knowing how much longer the Ukrainians will have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. They have to walk through it, as we have to walk through it, even as we have to walk through the challenges and pain. The shepherd walks with us. There's one more thing I would like to mention about this connection with the shepherd. Upon, up to this point, we have been talking about our Lord, the shepherd, as a third person. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores us. But it is at this point of our own vulnerability when we need him out of our fear that the direction shifts to a personal relationship. Thus far, we have been talking about God, but now we talk to God. Listen how this psalm shifts. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. When we talk about God, it keeps us at an intellectual and informational level. But when we talk to God, it is a personal level. There is intimacy. There is a connection. There is a deeper trust. There is a deeper confidence. That is when our relationship is secured so much so that we can say, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm glad that the table is prepared. But why the enemies? Have you ever thought of that? Don't you wish the enemies would just disappear? But then again, that is not what life is like, is it? The enemies are always there. They are the things that rob us of a good night's sleep. The relationships that give us heartburn. The workplace that brings us down. The medical bills that pile up. The phone call that won't come. The cancer that destroys the one's healthy body. The enemies are there. But the shepherd reminds us of his blessings as he anoints our heads with oil and our cup overflows. That's another parallelism. And it ends with the certainty that goodness and mercy shall follow us. It is significant to realize that the word mercy in the Hebrew is hesed, which means constant, unchanging love. 
And it is with this everlasting goodness and unconditional love that Christ the shepherd will pursue us all the days of our lives here on earth and into eternity. I know that in the scripture we read the word that goodness and mercy, mercy shall follow us. But in the Hebrew, the word follow is actually pursue. Imagine this, goodness and the mercy, the unconditional love of God will pursue us, not just follow, but God is pursuing us purposely with intention pursue us until the very end so that we may lack nothing and fear for nothing. The culture has changed significantly since the time when Psalm 23 was composed thousands of years ago. But Psalm 23 is still as relevant because we somehow know deep down inside there is a need for the shepherd who knows and calls us his own. On this day when we celebrate Mother's Day, and as the United Methodist denomination has dedicated it as the festival of the Christian home, we recognize, celebrate, and give thanks for all the women who share their hearts and homes with others. The mentors who guided us, the grandmothers who spoiled us, the teachers who illuminated us with wisdom, the aunties who made us laugh, the sisters who challenged us to reach for the stars, the men and fathers who stepped up to fill the role of parenthood out of love and necessity. As we remember them in our hearts or as we celebrate them in our memories, I pray that Psalm 23 will continue to be meaningful and powerful as we traverse through life's green pastures and still waters and through dark valleys while running on empty cups that we lack nothing for God's grace is sufficient for us today, tomorrow, and always. Amen?